I'm so happy to welcome tonight's speaker back to Data and Society. Ruha Benjamin is Associate Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, founder of the Just Data Lab, author of Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code, and editor of Captivating Technology, Reimagining Race, Carceral Technoscience, and Liberatory Imagination in Everyday Life, among many other publications. Ruha's work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology with a focus on the relationship between innovation and equality, health and justice, knowledge and power. She is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including from the, Advan um, the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study, and in 2017, she received the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton. Please join me in welcoming Ruha. Thank you for that introduction. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you so much to all the organizers, my wonderful colleagues, Sarita Amrut, CJ Landau, and Rigoberto Lara, and all my friends here at Data and Society. About a year ago, I had the opportunity to circulate the draft among Data and Society, and in particular, a few people who aren't here now that were also part of that uh, feedback session, Mutale Nkonde, uh, Jesse Daniels, and Khadija Ferriman, among many others. So thank you all for having me back now that the book is complete. I'd also like to join in the acknowledgement, uh, the land acknowledgement, and uh, think about this land and the traditional unceded territory of the Lenape. Let us acknowledge the intertwined legacies of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, which contribute to the creation and continued wealth of this city, of this nation. We acknowledge the reparations owed to black and indigenous communities and nations and the impossibilities of return for generations past. Let us also acknowledge the ancestors in the room tonight um, as we fight together for better futures. We are alive in an era of necessary resistance to preserve this planet and all the beautiful creation that we have no doubt, no doubt is worthy of the struggle. Ashe. With that, let me begin with three provocations. First, racism is productive, not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things, of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods and outdated, rather than innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, productive. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to think about the way that race and technology shape one another. More and more people are accustomed to thinking about the ethical and social impact of technology, but this is only half of the story. Social norms, values, and structures all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact of technology, but the social inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a resource, a battleground, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that many people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and social control. Racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination, misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, 
We can't only critique the underside, but we also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desire even, that many people have for social domination. So that's the trailer. Let's start with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of 911 calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app. And it also shows you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. Now many of you are probably thinking, what, what could possibly go wrong in the age of barbecue Beckys calling the police on black people, cooking, walking, breathing out of place? It turns out that even a Stanford-educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area, no less, is an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on a cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting, too, that the app Citizen was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. What's most important to our discussion, I think, is that Citizen and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact but also about how social norms, racial norms and structures shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. So how should we understand the duplicity of tech fixes, purported solutions that nevertheless reinforce and even deepen existing hierarchies? One formulation that's hard to miss is the idea of racist robots. A first wave of stories a few years ago seemed to be shocked at the prospect that, in Langdon Winner's terms, artifacts have politics. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And now I think we've entered a phase of attempts to override or address the default settings of racist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are used to differentiate us. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I term the new Jim Code, innovation that enables social containment, while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era. This riff off of Michelle Alexander's analysis in the new Jim Crow considers how the reproduction of racist forms of social control in successive institutional forms entails a crucial socio-technical component that not only hides the nature of domination, but allows it to penetrate every facet of social life under the guise of progress. This formulation, as I highlight here, is directly related to a number of other cousin concepts by Brown, Broussard, Daniels, Eubanks, O'Neill, Noble, and others. A quick example, hot off the presses, illustrating the new Jim Code. Racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sicker black patients, reports a new study by Obermeyer and colleagues, in which the researchers were able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. What's especially important to note is that the algorithm does not explicitly take note of race. That is to say, it is race neutral. By using cost to predict healthcare need, this digital triaging system unwittingly reproduces racial disparities because on average, black people incur fewer costs for a variety of reasons, including systemic racism. And in my review of their study, both of which you can download from the journal Science, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital if the predictions were actually based on need rather than cost. Race neutrality, it turns out, is a deadly force. So connecting this with a number of, of, of books and articles and works, the new Jim Code is, as I see it, situated in a hybrid literature that we can think of as race-critical code studies, 
And again, this approach is not only concerned about the impacts of technology, but its production, and particularly how race and racism enter the process. As we think about how anti-blackness gets encoded in and exercised through automated systems, I write about four conceptual offspring to the new Jim Code that fall along a kind of spectrum. And the book is organized around these in terms of the chapters. And at this point in the talk, I would normally dive into each of these with examples and analyses. But for the sake of time, I'm gonna shift gears now to focus on what many people and organizations are already doing about the problem. Like abolitionist practices of a previous era, not all manner of getting free should be exposed. Recall how Frederick Douglass reprimanded those who revealed the routes that fugitives took to escape slavery, declaring that those supposed white allies turned the Underground Railroad into the Upper Ground Railroad. Likewise, some efforts of those resisting the new Jim Code necessitate strategic discretion, while others may be effectively tweeted around the world in an instant. Exhibit A, 30 minutes after proposing an idea for an app that converts your daily change into bail money to free black people, Compton-born black trans tech developer, Dr. Courtney Zeigler added, and it could be called Appolition, a riff on abolition and a reference to a growing movement toward divesting resources from policing and prisons and reinvesting in education, employment, mental health, and a broader support system needed to cultivate safe and thriving communities. Calls for abolition are never simply about bringing harmful systems to an end, but also envisioning new ones. After all, the etymology of the word includes root words for to destroy and to grow. To date, Appalachian has raised more than $137,000, that money being directed to local organizations who've posted bail freeing at least 40 people. When Zeigler and I sat on a panel together at the Allied Media Conference, he addressed audience questions about whether the app is diverting even more money to a bloated carceral system. But as Zeigler clarified, money is returned to the depositor after a case is complete, so donations are continuously recycled to help individuals like an endowment. That said, the motivation behind ventures like abolition can be mimicked by people who don't have an abolitionist commitment. Zeigler described a venture that Jay-Z is investing millions in called Promise. Although Jay-Z and others call it a decarceration startup because it addresses the problem of pretrial detention, Promise is in the business of tracking individuals via the app and GPS monitoring, creating a powerful mechanism that makes it easier to lock people back up. Following criticism by the organization BYP100, we should understand that Promise exemplifies the new Jim Code. It's dangerous and insidious precisely because it's packaged as social betterment. The good news is that tech industry insiders themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism and militarism. For example, thousands of Google employees condemn the company's collaboration on a Pentagon program that uses AI to make drone strikes more effective, and a growing number of Microsoft employees are opposed to the company's ICE contract, saying that as people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. This kind of informed refusal is certainly necessary as we build a movement to counter the new Jim Code, but we can't wait for worker sympathies to sway the industry. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across our many institutions, can draw from past organizers' experiences in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today, and which includes building solidarity across race and class. For example, when the predominantly East African Amazon workers in the company's Minnesota warehouses organized a strike on Prime Day to demand better work conditions, some engineers from Seattle came to support. In terms of civil society, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Detroit Community Technology Project offer 
an even more far-reaching approach. The former brings people working across a number of agencies and organizations together in a proactive approach to tech justice, especially at the policy level. And the latter develops and uses technology rooted in community needs, offering support to grassroots networks doing data justice research, including hosting what they call discotechs, which stands for discovering technology, which are multimedia mobile neighborhood workshop fairs that can be adapted in other locales. And I'll just quickly mention one of the concrete collaborations that's grown out of Data for Black Lives. A few years ago, several government agencies in St. Paul, Minnesota, including the police department and the public schools, formed a controversial joint powers agreement called the Innovation Project, giving these agencies broad discretion to collect and share data on young people with the goal of developing predictive tools to identify at-risk youth in the city. There was immediate and broad-based backlash from the community with the support of the Data for Black Lives Network. And in 2017, a group of over 20 local organizations formed what they called the Stop the Cradle to Prison Algorithm Coalition. Eventually, the city of St. Paul dissolved the agreement in favor of what they call, I'll call a more community-led approach, which was a huge victory for activists and community members who'd been fighting these policies for over a year. Another abolitionist approach to the new Jim Code that I'd like to mention is the Our Data Bodies Digital Defense Playbook, which you can download for free online and make a donation to the organization if you're inclined. The playbook contains in-depth guidelines for facilitating workshops and group activities, plus tools, tip sheets, reflection pieces, and rich stories crafted from in-depth interviews in communities from Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles that are dealing with pervasive and punitive data collection and data-driven systems with the aim of developing power, not paranoia, according to our data bodies. And although the playbook presents some of the strategies people are using, in the spirit of Douglas's admonition about the Upper Ground Railroad, not everything that the team knows is exposed. Detroit-based digital justice activist Tawana Petty, let, put it bluntly, she says, let me be real. Y'all get in the digital defense playbook, but we didn't tell you all their strategies, and we never will, because we want our communities to continue to survive and to thrive. And so the stuff that's keeping them alive, we keep into ourselves. And finally, when it comes to rethinking STEM education as a ground zero for reimagining the relationship between technology and society, there are a number of initiatives underway. I'll just mention one very concrete resource that you can also download, the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook, developed by our very own wonderful colleagues here at Data and Society. The aims of this intervention are threefold. First is to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. The fact is, data disenfranchisement and domination has always been met with resistance and appropriation in which activists, scholars, and artists have sharpened abolitionist tools that employ data for liber liberation. From Du Bois's modernist data visualizations to Ida B. Wells Barnett's expert deployment of statistics in the red record, there's a long tradition of employing and challenging data for black lives. In that spirit, the late legal and critical race scholar, Derek A. Bell, encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals. He said that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be. And so one of my favorite examples of what we might call a Bellian racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-black logics embedded in high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white-collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high-risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. 
not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like this are only comical when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing practices and proposals in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. So if, as I've suggested at the start, the carceral imagination captures and contains, then an abolitionist imagination opens up possibilities and pathways. It creates new templates and builds on critical intellectual traditions that have continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. May we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing I was hoping you would do for us after reading the book is to take us through how you bring together seemingly trivial design decisions and their broader implications. And there's so many good examples, but one that really struck me was the soap dispenser and skin color detection. Yeah. Sure, so you all remember a few years ago when that viral video went around of two friends trying to use a soap dispenser and it wouldn't work on the darker skin. And they are laughing at the time and also it circulated in a kind of humorous critique of this seemingly benign technology. And so I, I use that as a kind of entry point to think um, beyond the superficial and beyond that one technology to the, the, the broader design implications of that and how in much more consequential situations we might not laugh in, in that case. So you think about you know, Joy Bolomini's fantastic research about facial recognition and the implications of that being adopted in policing, for example. And so linking something that seems rather trivial, but using it as a gateway to think about these bigger, um, these bigger questions and issues is one sort of methodology that I employ in the text, in, in some sense to um, disrupt the categories that we use in our heads to make sense of the world. So I'm trained as a sociologist, and we have a knack of creating little tables, like two by two tables, to make sense of everything, you know, and fitting, fitting things into a grid, and, and making distinctions between, let's say, what is superficial and what's consequential. And so one of my sort of modes of moving through this material is to kind of disrupt that, and rather than trying to make so many distinctions about types of technologies or varieties of ethics is to draw connections and to, and to engage in a more integrative mode that's connecting dots rather than trying to, in, in some sense, create a new database looking at technology. And so, um, and so for some people, that's really frustrating. Like I've had readers say to me, it's just all over the place. You know, they want, they want the two by two table um, and then others, some appreciate the fact that I'm trying to draw together seemingly disparate technologies, doing very different things in a world, in some ways because my goal here is to develop a conceptual toolkit that can be applied in a variety of contexts so that um, trying to neatly divide up the, divide up the technologies wasn't a big, a big a priority for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, another thing about the soap dispenser that you do so nicely is you show how consequential it is for the kinds of worlds that have been made possible and those that are foreclosed. Um, and that also makes me think about some of your comments throughout the book on the question of intent and intentionality. So you, you warn us that we need to move past a discussion about whether algorithms or their makers intend to be racist. Yeah. But at the same time, you argue that the purpose and intention behind design really matters. I was wondering if you could walk us through how you think about those two aspects of intentionality. Yeah, this is a good example of writing is thinking. So the way that I started out writing about intentionality was very different than how it ended up. Um, because first I'll say one of the, the sort of questions that I get and I think people thinking about technology in this way get often is um, 
but do they are, do they intend to be racist, right? Like we're looking for the racist boogeyman behind the screen and using that as a measure of how to then assess the impact of, of these technologies. And so in my effort initially to push back against that, I went like to the extreme and was like, intentionality is not important. Stop thinking about intentionality. Stop asking about intentionality. I just went to the extreme of um, a post-intentional analysis of technology. And then in fact, through my conversations with one of my colleagues, Tamara Knopper, um, who was pushing back as she was reading drafts and she was like, it's not that there's no intentionality. You know, you can't design something without intention, right? That's not possible. You're thinking, you're intending it for to do something. And so it may be that in not thinking about or not valuing the sociality or the political landscape, that in itself is a priority, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it got me to think differently that the intention to be racist is not the only intention that we should be looking for. The intention, let's say, to maximize profit Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. is a powerful engine that certainly we know historically in terms of racial capitalism has powerfully, um, you know, discriminatory effects. And so I think in part it, it, it's looking for all of the variety of desires, intention, assumptions that animate the design process without needing it to be um, cloaked in a white hood carrying a torch okay. as the sort of litmus test about whether then we deem it racist or not. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to link that to something that came up in your talk about these three phases of the racist robots. Yeah. Um, so we, you mentioned that we might be in a third phase now, which is about overcoming what's yeah. been recognized as racism. Yeah. How are you thinking about that? How do you analyze that move? Yeah, so you know, I think that there's a lot of um, work being done around fairness, transparency, accountability, right? Fat. Um, and with respect to machine learning, um, the more that the problem is exposed, there's an effort both within tech and a number of collaborations to try to fix the technology, make it less biased. So with that healthcare algorithm, for example, the researchers are actually able to collaborate with the company to sort of rewrite that so that it doesn't have that racially disparate effect, right? So that's one example where there is a, there's energy and motivation to get the tech right, which I think is on one level, perfectly fine, right? But in some ways, that continues to narrow the scope of our um, analysis and our movement building to think that just by getting the technology right, that then we are, have fixed the larger inputs that, that are make this so consequential. And so, you know, thinking again to the healthcare algorithm, whether that particular algorithm gets it right, is that not going to magically then, like fairy dust, fix the you know the larger healthcare? Whether it has to do with the insurance structure or the fact that you know there's a lot of racism both in medical curriculum and the training process, et cetera, et cetera. So my my challenge is to yes, focus on the sort of technological changes that we have the power to do, but not to lose sight of the larger structures that continue to then um, fuel, fuel the problem. And so it's a both and yeah. um, suggestion rather than um, getting so self-satisfied mm -hmm. with um, our tech, tech fixes in this context. That's mm -hmm. extremely helpful. It's extremely helpful to think about getting the tech right as being important, but also a limiting framework for our action and our movement building, which brings me to the subtitle of the book. Um, the subtitle is Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. And you did a great job in the, uh, in the, in the talk talking about abolitionism. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering if you could maybe unpack the tools part a little bit mm -hmm. for us. So how do you w link the work of abolitionism to creating a toolkit yeah. to do this wider movement building work? And you gave us so many good examples of that. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think in part um, that that subtitle is an attempt to kind of reappropriate the idea of what a tool is, like what we think of as a tool in its most generic, expansive sense, that um, the hardware and software don't have, don't monopolize <laughs> the this, this, this space of tool making. And so here I'm thinking about all of the ways, I think of race as a technology or a tool that creates, produces certain things in the world as a, a harmful tool, but what would it mean to enact and cultivate um, life-affirming tools that support 
empower, et cetera. And so in thinking about abolitionist tools, I'm really referring not to things necessarily that we have to create, but that already exist in the ways that communities try to seed their own well-being and, and, and um, you know, cultivate life-affirming practices. And so some of that is thinking about social tools, how we relate to one another, how we engage art, you know, um, community building. And so again, abolitionist tools in the talk, I used um, abolition as a touchstone for that, like as something very concrete, um, just as a way in, again, for us to think about, in that case, the, the designer of that, it wouldn't be, an abolitionist tool if it was not connected to the social infrastructure of community organizations that were already engaged in this work, right? And so the tool becomes puts to service in what communities are already doing and activists are already doing rather than the tech fix sort of floating down and purporting to solve something for a community. Um, and so it's really about zooming out again and thinking about what's the social infrastructure in which technologies operate and that there's other tools already in place, already being honed that in some ways um, are vital to social change rather than just looking to the ones that are um, developed within industry. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna ask one more question and open it up. I know people are anxiously waiting. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, it's just beautiful, it's luminous. And one thing I kept wondering as I was, as I was reading was, you know, kind of, are you, are you a secret poet? Some of the terms Ruha deploys, the new Jim Code, anti-black box, um, the anti-black box, race critical code studies. I wanted to ask you, what do you think the power is in naming things and how do you deploy that as itself a tool of your practice? So first I'll answer that I am a closet poet. Um, well, I was in college um, and then grad school sucked the life out of me and I've slowly been trying to regain my footing since. Um, but, you know, I think part of that is trying to enact um, something beyond the critique of technology. And when we think about what needs to change, what where the, where the, where the levers of power are, for me, the process of problem formulation and naming the problem that technology is supposed to then solve is ground zero. Like before you even begin collecting data, developing a technology, designing anything, you have to decide what is the problem that this technology is supposed to solve. And as it stands, a very, very narrow slice of humanity is posing the problems. Um, nay, framing the questions that then our digital and material infrastructure is designed to somehow intervene in. And so it is important for not just me, but for me to encourage um, a more democratic vision, a more creative vision of people who are playing in that problem space, who are experimenting, who are naming their own reality rather than having someone else name it and then try to fix it. And so in some ways my play with language is both trying to make it enjoyable to read um, because it's, it's more enjoyable to write. <laughs> and so in some ways the genres of writing that I was trained in you know, as an academic, again, I said suck the life out of me. And in some ways then you circulate that and it's not enlivening or vivifying the person on the other end if it wasn't enjoyable for you to write. And so in part, it's a mirroring of what I hope the work to do that I wanna enjoy actually producing it so that you enjoy reading it, right? Um, in part, because I think of knowledge as not simply something that's cognitive, but it's also something that we produce in terms of our feelings and our relations through art. And so um, it's, it's trying to expand how we know the world, mm. not simply through very rigid categories or very dry analysis, but it's also through stories, it's through, you know, sort of thinking about the joy of, of, of how we play with language and words. And so that's where, and some of it is gonna be dry. There are parts of the, the, the book that are just, you're gonna be like, oh, she lied to me. This is really <laughs> standard sociological analysis, which, you know, it's in there, but I, I hope to counter, to balance that out with um, a lot of references and engagement with popular culture and with, with other, with other things that um, are not your traditional sociology. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. There will be a mic that will come around if you have a question. And if you feel comfortable saying your name, your pronoun, and where you're coming from tonight, that would be great, too. Raise your hand if you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Ruha and everyone. My name is Carol, and I am also a sociologist, an interdisciplinary sociologist and media studies scholar and practitioner. And part of my research focuses on AI and all of this work that you're doing, Ruha. And also, I am in the process of developing a nonprofit called Harlem Media Institute, where I live in Harlem, which addresses the part of the issues of the meteoric rise of technology, how it's affecting my communities. And what you said about community engagement really resonated with me because that's what part of my focus is on, is to look at how the community is being involved, getting engaged with this technology. My question to you is, when you talk about this technology and how it is affecting the lives, particularly of black and brown and indigenous people, what is the response from your white audiences? Do they feel like they're being picked on? Do they feel like, well, why is it always us that are, we're the, one, we're the bad guys? Because in this technology discussion, especially on Twitter, following you as I do and other yeah. scholars who are um, involved in AI technology, it's all, we are the people of color, we are the ones who are being, um, what's the word I'm looking for, I guess targeted, that's it, yeah. yeah. So what, is, what are some of the feedbacks yeah. that you, or what is some of the feedback that you get when you are having these discussions? Yeah. Thank, thanks for that question. Carol, right? Yes. N nice to hear your question, Carol. And I would say that one of the most surprising things from the time I started the project to now has been the general shift of consciousness and discourse in this country around technology. And I think in part we can point to some big sort of spectacular things that happened, whether Cambridge Analytica or other, where the general sentiment seems to be much more on the skeptical, mistrustful end of the spectrum for everyone. Whereas perhaps a few years ago, we would see that um, expressed most by communities who've always been on the underside of progress, who have been used in the process of honing scientific and technological um, tools and often have not benefited in the end from that. And so in some ways I've seen an expansion of that sentiment across the body politic for obvious reasons. I thought um, initially when I would be speaking about it, I was projecting into the future, I thought I would be, have to be much more on the defensive and get much more push, pushback than I actually have been so far, knock on, couch. Um, and so um, that, that has been surprising. And so in, in some ways, I think the challenge now is to channel that sentiment. What do we do sort of moving from as our body, uh, you know, our body, um, digital body says from paranoia to power, right? And so it hasn't been as you, as you might suspect, um, a kind of um, uh, backlash against the work. Rather, I've heard people talk about the general tech lash that seems to characterize um, the larger discourse around this. And so um, it, it hasn't manifested in the way that you, you might suspect and might have a few years ago. Yeah, thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Age. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I don't have like a fully formed question, but I'm really struck by the quote that you brought in um, around the Underground Railroad and the Overground Railroad and then thinking about that, um, the work that people put together in the, in the playbook. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious around how you're thinking about, I'm not asking you to like say things you don't wanna say, no, no, but yeah. how you're thinking about that in creating this book and then also mm -hmm. 
I feel like personally I, I continually come up against my own like sh shit <laughs> around visibility and around sharing resources and also that people are listening in and like, you know, there might be a lot of really good intentions in a room, but not everyone's on the same page. So I, I'm just- Yeah, uh, no, I curious. have some thoughts around that. So, you know, I think about how that organization is enacting knowledge production as a counterpoint to the big data ethos that more data, more information, more, more, more is always better right? Exposing, getting everything out there in the open. And there, there's a, as a kind of discretion being enacted where, yes, we're going to make some things known, but we're also going to withhold knowledge, right? As part of the politic. And so I think about that in the context of what I've called in other work, informed refusal as a counterpoint to informed consent. And I draw on the work of indigenous scholars like Audra Simpson and Kim Tallbear, which they're describing informed refusal, not simply in what indigenous communities do vis-a-vis -vis scientists, but also in their own ethnographic methodology, that they refuse to write up everything that their respondents talk about because of the ways that can be misused and turned against them. And this really runs against a kind of enlightenment ethos that just we just, you know, more knowledge is always better or, more, you know, putting it all out there. And so I think it, it, it's saying something about trying to enact what your what your your critique in some ways, trying to trying to internalize it and let it inform your practice so that um, you're learning as you're going. And, and so, you know, I would encourage those who are interested in this idea, you can find the article I refer to, Informed Refusal, on the research tab of, of my website, and it also cites this larger body of scholarship that I draw on to conceptualize. Um, and I would fit this particular um, framing of the handbook within that, within that literature. Hey, thanks, Ruha. That was a beautiful talk. My name's Hugo. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I work in data education um, and, and machine learning and AI education. So you spoke wonderfully to, um, I mean, the importance but limitations of, I suppose, labor movements in directing um, what industry is capable of and, and can do, community movements. Um, historically, after these, we've seen industrial movements and then legislative movements, usually in, in that order, and I'm wondering where you see this this going. I mean, for example, big companies uh, d getting on board and then, then governments legislating, hopefully, yeah. and, and the power of that. Yeah, if I, if I understand um, the question correctly, I, I, I see um, certainly policy legal changes afoot that need to happen, that are happening, whether we think about the various moratoriums and bans on facial recognition as just a starting point, but just thinking even proactively, not just banning, but what kind of governance structure do we need to reconceptualize the relationship between society and technology as one pillar or, or one pathway that we need lots of people working on. I also see the organizing pathway, whether it's tech industry organizing, community organizing, but to get that pushed, we need mass mobilization. We need political education. Um, I think about litigation, right? We have increasingly lawyers thinking about what it means to litigate algorithms. We saw the case, for example, in Michigan, where then Governor Snyder adopted an automated decision system that was meant to alert um, the state about cases of unemployment fraud and um, flagged up to 40,000 people and was wrong in 93% of the cases. Meanwhile, people went bankrupt, they committed suicide, they got divorced, you know, all because of this automated system flagging them as a, a fraudulent um, uh, person and having ripple effects. So there's a class action lawsuit now underway in Michigan around this, not the only one in which lawyers are trying to think about what it means to redress when harms are done. So that's an avenue of action and energy that we need. And my own sort of main pathway is really thinking about education, um, bo both in the popular education sense, but also in rethinking what STEM education looks like. Yesterday I had the chance to virtually have a conversation with students at a STEM high school in LA. And let me tell you something. I mean, they asked questions like, what 
what is platform cooperativism? <laughs> and what is cognitive equity? Uh, aren't we being hypocritical by using these tech, these uh, you know, uh, uh, various apps while we X, Y, and Z? I mean, the questions they asked of all, almost all of the kind of um, lectures and Skype visits I've been doing were so pointed and so infused with the social and historical literacy, you know, it seemed, and I, I had to believe that it was already part of their STEM training, right? It couldn't have been just simply reading something I'd written recently because it was so informed with a, uh, you know, a deeper sense of um, what's going on, you know? Um, and so for me, that is what really gets me excited as seeding um, a, a, a different way of thinking about um, not simply ethics of technology, but the politics and sociality of it. And so that's another pathway. And I'm sure there's more that I am not even addressing. But in some ways, I feel like this is a all hands on deck. It's not a we do this first and then this happens. It's about let's find our niche and get to work and build these networks. And there's a lot of organizations that are trying to do this umbrella work of drawing together these different these different pathways, including you know da uh, data for Black Lives, and and so um, you know I think part of it is to just not leave it up to those who are the technical experts to tell us uh, what the ethics are or what the next step forward are. I think that is that is if I can point to one wrong way to go, it would be leaving it up to those who've produced the problem to solve the problem. Hi, I'm Adam, they, them. Uh, very grateful to be here. Um, one kind of theme that you've been discussing both in your presentation and in these questions um, is kind of what you described as thin description mm -hmm. um, and kind of how that is a digital defense mechanism and kind of a tension, a tension that I identified while reading the book was how uh, tech corporations engage in their own thin description by both demanding others of being kind of radically exposed, um, but not doing it themselves. And I'm wondering kind of whether you could speak to that and whether exposure of their practices is necessarily the most prudent way of going about that. Yeah, so I wish you would have read a draft a year ago and I would have enfolded that critique or that insight into my own analysis. And I haven't thought a lot about that, um, the way that my advocacy of a kind of thin description mirrors in many ways um, how we're exposed, whether you know it has to do at the level of screens or skin or whatever that thinness entails. And so if you will allow me, I'll sit with that and think about that a while and hopefully we'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you.